Hello YouTube, XCT here. Today we are solving UT99, an intermediate Windows box on PG Practice, as requested on the Valendev Discord. On this box we are going to exploit a SEH-based buffer overflow, and to make it a bit more fun, we'll do that one manually instead of just firing some exploit from ExploitDB. Then for root, we will place a malicious DLL in the path of system and reboot the box, which will result in a privileged shell. So as always, we start with a port scan and we can see that there's FTP on 21, we have ATN 443, um, so there's a web server, there's a MySQL server, and then there are a lot of um, IRC-related ports, which we'll have a look at later. So for now, let's just um, start by looking at the web server. And here we have some kind of gaming site. Um, let's look at the source real quick. You can see this is the Dragonfly CMS, so it might be worth to look into vulnerability for the CMS, but in this case we are not going to do it. Um, other than that, there is some post here by a user called Fluffy, and it's telling that Daisy has set up a practice server for users to get back into the swing of things, so there must be some kind of game server running. Um, this post is telling us to join IRC and Mumble. Let's look at the response mentioning IRC again. So there is likely an IRC server we can connect to, which matches the ports we saw earlier, right? So if you want to install um, IRC client, you can, for example, use HexChat. I already installed it here. And if you start it, it looks like that. We have to add a network. So let's just call this UT99. So we have to give it the IP address here and the port. Let's do it like that. Close. And now we should be able to connect. And this looks good. We are connected. Let's see if there are any channels. Let's see if we can find any. And there's one we can join. And there are actually no messages, but yeah, this topic here, which is telling us that the Unreal Tournament 99 game server is running on port 7778, which is actually um, the default port. And if you look for vulnerabilities for Unreal Tournament 99, you will find that there's a remote buffer overflow, which is SEH-based, and this is exactly the one we are going to exploit. But we're not just going to copy it from ExploitDB, we are going to write it from scratch, um, from a POC script um, I created. So let's start by Introducing the basic proof of concept here, we connect to the target system, which is a local Windows VM in this case, via UDP and the port we just saw, and send the basic command, which gives us some version information. And this is uh, both locally and remote version 436. So if you want to try that out locally, you have to get that version somewhere of Google, right? Um, and the exploit itself, it's basically sending the secure command and then a bunch of A's, and this will overflow stuff so it crashes. Um, let's see if that actually works. Going to go to my Windows VM here, starting the UT server. Um, we can see it bound to port 7778, so it's the same as on a target system here as well. Let's attach WinDebug. And we have to attach this UCC binary. This is the, the server, right? Let's run the POC. And here in the output, we can see that the version is 436, like I just mentioned. So it just prints that if you send the basic command. Here the application crashed. Um, we hit the breakpoint. And if you look at the registers here, you can see that um, we don't have control over the instruction pointer. So something else must have happened. And if we do the xchain command here, we will see that we have overwritten the next SEH handler pointer and the pointer to the exception handler itself. This means that we are dealing with a SEH-based buffer overflow. And maybe just a, a really brief explanation. Um, so basically, if you have try catch in a program, um, as soon as an exception is hit, you will go to the catch block. And the way this is handled in memory is that you have um, these pointers to exception handlers, which are on the stack. Um, they are stored in a linked list. And if you overflow the stack, you have a chance to overwrite these. And if we have a short look at the tab here, we can see that the exception list here is at the first position. And these entries in the exception list actually look like that. You have the exception registration record, which has a pointer to the next exception handler and the handler itself. So it's a linked list of these, right? And whenever an exception occurs, it will go through the linked list and execute the handlers, um, hoping that one of them will actually handle the exception. 
So if you were to overwrite one of these handlers, like it's uh, the case now, we could hijack execution flow. And usually what you would put into such a handler is a pop-up red gadget, because that takes you straight to your payload. There are some mitigations against these kinds of attacks, like save SEH, um, but in this case they are not enabled, and we will see that in a second while going through the exploit. So let's restart the application and go back to Linux. So the next thing we have to do is we have to find at which offsets these overrides are occurring, right? So let's create a pattern with MSF. And then we're going to send it. And we crashed again. Let's use Xchain again. And here we can see um, parts of our pattern. So let's copy these values. And now we can do MSF pattern offset to find the exact offset. Okay, so this overwrite is at position 28. And this one at 24. And this is the next exception handler, and this is the exception handler. So let's update our proof of concept here. We no longer need the pattern. Let's send 24 A's followed by 4 B's and 4 C's. And a good practice when writing these kind of exploits is to keep the buffer size the same on all exploit attempts. So I'm just going to fill up the rest with Z's here. So let's run that. Got a crash again. Let's use the xchain command. And we can see that this worked. We have our NSEH handler here and our SEH handler overwritten with B's and C's, just um, like we wanted to. So the next thing we want to do is we want to find um, such a pop-pop red gadget, which is um, often used in these kind of exploits. So we pass control to the buffer we send to the program and in the end to our shellcode. So let's try to find that. And I'm going to use Mona here because that's um, the easiest um, way I know. And the command is pymona seh dash n, and it will search for these pop-pop red gadgets, right? And there are a couple ones here. Um, we can take any of them. Let's just take that one here. And now we replace that with the address we just found, and this is pop pop red. Let's restart the application again. Place a breakpoint at this address. Continue. If everything went well, we should break at the address now. So this is our exception. Um, let's continue once. And to handle the exception, it has called our custom exception handler here. So now let's step through this red. And now we're actually at the beginning of the buffer we sent. So these five A's here, this is all the Z characters we sent. These are the B's we sent. And if you look at these values here, this is actually um, the address we entered in our exploit. It's put onto the stack here. So this is a bit of a problem. Um, just compare here, it's 10, 14, 83, 57. And this is here in memory, just backwards. So if you would um, continue stepping here, we would eventually run in this address and this would mess up everything because there's an access violation here. What people usually do, and this is kind of default in most SEH exploits, um, is that you, you put a short jump here that just jumps over this one address. You jump like six bytes ahead and you land in all the stuff that's behind this pointer. And this is exactly what we are going to do now. And remember, we can put this jump here because these Bs at this location are the NSEH handler and they are put here onto the stack. So we have four bytes we can use for instructions to jump over this. So to find the instruction for our jump, let's use MSF NASM shell. And then we just tell it to jump short, um, let's say eight. And we get an instruction for that, which is EB06. So we do EB06. And we add two knobs. So that looks good, I think. Let's run that. Our gadget again, return, and we land exactly on the jump we just created. And 
if the calculation was correct, we should land exactly on top of our Zs here. So that worked. And now it would execute whatever we have here, right? So as a next step, um, you probably want to send shell code, right? But there's one step we have to do before, and this is checking for bad characters, which can be a bit tedious, but we really have to do it. So first of all, let's copy in all possible byte values like that. Um, yeah, that looks good. And now let's just add them down here. And let's send that. We add our gadget again. Let's take the jump. And now let's try to check if our buffer actually arrived here. And this looks kind of good. We can see our bytes here, but it seems to end early. And here we got 5a, 5b, and then 00. So 5c must be a bad character because our buffer got interrupted here, right? So let's replace that one bad character. And let's send it again. And here we go. This looks a lot better. We can see our one here, 5b, 5d, 5e. Now we get past this um, gap we had here. And it goes all the way to the end. And then our sets are starting. So this was the only bad character besides um, the null byte, most likely. So now it's shellcode time. Um, let's use MSF Venom here to generate some. It's just a shell reverse TCP, so we can catch it with netcat. Nothing special. Actually, start the listener as well. Let's copy all of that. And this looks good. Let's just send it instead of the bad characters now. And instead of having the debugger running, we are just going to start it like that. And we hope that it works. Here we go, we got our shell. So this is working fine. So the last thing left to do is to regenerate that shellcode, this time with my IP from the VPN. And also I'm going to swap that L server to R server, so it's targeting the real system we are attacking. This should be good. Let's start the listener again. And let's run the exploit. And our user is Daisy. So that looks good. Let's see if there are any flags. And here's our local.txt. So the first part is done. So I don't particularly like the shell. So we are going to generate a metaprater one. Um, just like that. Our IP. And then we start a listener. Let's use certutil to download that to this box. That worked, and now let's run it. And here we get our shell. So this one is a bit easier to work with. So the first thing I want to do is I want to run a privilege escalation script. So um, let's grab one from our box to copy that command here to save some time. We are using certutil again, and I'm going to run the privask check script from itman. That's the one I always run. And then we're going to run it like that. Um, you could theoretically enter interactive powder shell shell, but it's a bit broken here. So the only way I could make it work is to use this syntax. So let's look at the results. And there's one really interesting one here. And you might have seen this a lot when you run a script, but never really exploited it, maybe. Um, the idea here being that this DLL doesn't really exist on the system, but it wants to be executed or loaded uh, when the system boots. So if you would have a chance to place that DLL in some place, system is looking for DLLs, it would execute. And this could be a privilege escalation. But it would require to reboot the box, which isn't always possible. But in this case, it really might be. And also, there's another really interesting result here, which is um, 
path folder permissions. We can see that the system path contains two folders, which is CPython scripts and CPython. And it's telling us that we have permission to write there. So these two things combined um, basically mean that we can place this DLL in Python or Python scripts and have it executed upon a reboot. We can confirm this here. And here we see it as well. Authenticated users have modified permissions. Um, the only thing left is that we need permission to reboot. So let's check who am I all. And yeah, we have the SE shutdown privilege, which is the one we need. So we basically have everything we want. Let's um, create our payload here. Just going to copy that. Um, MSF Venom, same payload as before really, but this time in the DLL format instead of um, EXE, right? So let's generate that to put it in my web folder. And then we're going to download it with search usual again. Um, this is my box, the DLL we just generated, and we put it into um, Python scripts and then the DLL name. Okay, this seems to have worked. And now we basically have to make the box reboot and also start a listener real quick again, right? So let's do that. exit, start a new listener, and now we have to wait and hope that it worked. And here we go. We got a shell again. Let's check our permissions. And we are indeed system. So let's grab that last flag. Should be on Fluffy, I think. And here's our proof.txt. So that's it for the box. If you liked the video, please subscribe and click the like button. And let me know if you want to see um, other content, uh, more PG practice, maybe more Windows binary exploitation. Just let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Thank you and see you next week.